In this section, we are going to talk about Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Now, if you recall, Kepler stole the data that had been taken of the heavens by Tycho Brahe. And Kepler analyzed that data, looked through the information, and what he found was he found three, three rules. The word law in science means this is the way it is. Um, and he found that there were three descriptions of how planetary bodies behaved. And you need to know each of these. You need to know all three laws of Kepler. So here's the first one. Kepler's first law says the planets orbit the sun in ellipses with the sun at one focus. Aristotle and his bunch believed that the orbits were all perfect circles. And that belief permeated for about 2,000 years. When Kepler actually started looking at the numbers, he found that was not true. These orbits were not perfect circles. They were actually ellipses. And an ellipse is more of a law elongated or squashed circle. Now, how squashed or elongated a circle is can be described by the circle's eccentricity. And you need to know this term, eccentricity. The eccentricity of an ellipse is one number that helps determine how round or how oblong a circle, or excuse me, how oblong an orbit will be. Eccentricities always vary between 0 and 1. If something is a perfect circle, it has an eccentricity of 0. It is not at all elliptical. It is perfectly circular. If you have a straight line, it's going to have an eccentricity of 1. And that means that it's just going to be straight like that. So all eccentricities you and I are going to see are going to be between 0 and 1.0. They're going to be between those two numbers. Now let's take a look at some actual eccentricities of some planetary objects. The Earth's orbit has an eccentricity 0 0.0167. That is very, very close to zero. Mars has an eccentricity of 0 0.0934. This is actually many times bigger than the eccentricity of the Earth. But one of the reasons why it took so long for anyone to realize that orbits were elliptical as opposed to being circular is because the Earth and many of the local planets have eccentricities that are so close to being perfect circles that it was not easy to detect. And in order to detect it, you had to have good astronomic data. And that's what Kepler had. Halley's Comet has an eccentricity of 0 0.967. That means it has goes way out and comes way back. Perfect straight line is 1. So this is a long straight kind of orbit. Now Kepler's law says that each planet sweeps out an ellipse with the sun at one focus. So what do we mean by this focus thing? If you have a perfect circle, a circle is defined as every point is the same distance, the radius, from the center of the circle. An ellipse is actually defined not by one distance, but by two points, and the sum of their distances always stays constant. Um, in astronomy labs, we very typically draw ellipses, and it's quite easy to do. If you have the two points that represent where the ellipse is going to be centered on, and one of them would represent the sun, the other one is just a mathematical point in space. Now the two points that define an ellipse are called foci in the plural, or each is a focus singular. There is a string that we draw, that we have between those two, and as you draw an ellipse, you put your pen here and you sweep it around and sweep it around the other direction and flip the string and sweep it here and sweep it the other direction. And that is actually how you draw an ellipse. Nature is not drawing an ellipse with 
pins and points. This is how we can recreate it in lab. We will be calculating in our labs, we're going to be calculating the eccentricity of some of these orbits. In order to do that, you have to measure some properties of your ellipse. Now the two points are called the foci. One of this represents the position of the Sun. The other one is a mathematical point in space and what's there? Nothing. Just absolutely nothing. If you draw a line through the long axis of an ellipse, that is called the major axis. If you draw a line through the short axis of an ellipse, it is called the minor axis. If you have half of the major axis, that is called the semi-major axis. Now, why do you care? You're going to be measuring these numbers on the ellipses you draw for lab. You're then going to use this information to calculate eccentricity. So eccentricity is calculated as C divided by A, where C is the distance from one focus to the center, or one focus to this um, minor axis, and A is the distance from the minor axis to the outside edge drawn on the long side. Uh, when you actually calculate eccentricity, it's going to be a unitless number because let's say you measure in centimeters divided by centimeters, they're going to cancel and you're going to end up with no units. Kepler's second law of planetary motion is called the law of equal areas. And Kepler's second law says this, if you draw a line between the sun and the planets and you will let a period of time elapse, let's say one month. And as it goes around its orbit, if you take that sort of as a area, what fraction of the ellipse does this represent? That quantity of area is going to be the same for all sections of the orbit. So if a planet is way out on the far edge of the ellipse, a long way from the sun, the area swept out during that period of time is going to be the same here as there. And if you pick a point part way at a different spot in the year, and again one month goes by, the same exact quantity of area will be swept out. Now what does this mean for you and I? What it actually means is the fact that speed is going to vary. There are times when the planet is close to the Sun where it's going to be traveling very, very fast. And when it is a long way from the Sun, it's going to be traveling slow. This change in velocity of a planetary, planetary body orbiting a star is the most important part of Kepler's second law. So one more time, and this is important and you do need to know this, that when planets are close they are going to travel very much faster, and when they are far away, they are going to travel slower. Now the points in a planet's orbit when it is furthest from the Sun or closest to the Sun has names, and these names are aphelion, ap for being um, at the apex of the orbit, the highest point in its orbit. Helio, as you know, means Sun. When something is closest to the Sun, it is at perihelion. Helio again for Sun, para meaning close. You need to know the terms aphelion and perihelion. Now personally, I find these kind of tricky, and here's how I remember them. I remember that when something is at aphelion, it is like apples. They're very, very high on trees. Peppers, like perihelion, are grow close to the ground. So when something is at perihelion, it is close to the sun. And when it is at aphelion, it is high and a long distance from the sun. Two other terms you need to know are apogee and perigee. G, as in geo, means earth. So when something is at apogee, when it is orbiting the earth, that means the point where it is highest in its orbit. 
Perigee is the place in something's orbit when it is closest to the Earth. And a lot of people do not realize that the moon changes its, its distance to us because of its elliptical orbit. When the moon is at perigee and close to us, it's only 357,000 kilometers away. When it is at apogee, it's another 50,000 kilometers further away from us. And that actually does change the appearance of the moon in the sky. Uh, you will hear people on the news refer to a supermoon. Uh, a supermoon basically is journalist talk for perigee, meaning that the moon is a full moon at perigee, and so it appears a little bit bigger in the sky. When we have a full moon at perigee, it's about 14% bigger than when we have a full moon at apogee. So it does actually change size a little night after night and month after month. Kepler's third law of planetary motion is a mathematical law. Do not panic uh, if you're not keen on math. We're not going to do math really with this. Um, but Kepler's third law relates the time it takes for a planet to orbit. T in this case means the time to orbit, which is often called to called the period of the orbit. R is the radius of the orbit. And Kepler discovered that for every planet in our solar system, if you take the time for it to orbit and square it, divided by its radius cubed, it created a constant. And that constant is known today as Kepler's constant. Now that constant is going to be different if you are orbiting the Sun, or if you're orbiting the Earth, or you're orbiting Proxima Centauri. Um, there's going to be a different constant, but for one planetary body that is the center of the orbits, that constant will be the same. So what is Kepler's third law even, why do we even worry about it if we're not going to do the math for it? Well, what it says is this. It says that planets that are close to the Sun are going to be traveling faster. So if you have a planet like Mercury that is quite close to the Sun, and you have a planet like Uranus or Neptune that is a long way away from the Sun, it's going to mean the speed is going to change. So let's take a look at this. Mercury, very close to the Sun, orbits very, very fast. It has a period of revolution going around the Sun, 88 days. Not quite three months. Earth, of course, is defined as one year. By the time you get out to Jupiter, it has a period of revolution of 12 years. And Neptune at the far edges of the solar system, 165 years. So close things next to a star are going to orbit fast and far away. They're going to orbit much more slowly. When we start talking about our, our solar system, um, there's two terms that I want you to work on, on learning. The term re revolution and rotation. And I admit, I still to this day, after all these years, fight to make sure I say the right thing at the right time. Revolution is the time it takes a planet to orbit the sun. This is its revolution. Go back to the concept of Copernicus. And Copernicus started a revolution when he said that the Earth revolves around the sun. When we start talking about a planetary body and its period of rotation, this is the time it takes for it to orbit on its own axis. For the Earth, its period of rotation is 24 hours. It takes 24 hours for the Earth to spin around once and for us to have one day here on planet Earth. All right, ladies and gents, that's going to end this section. We're going to come back next time and we'll talk about Galileo Galilei.